And she looks right at me and she's like, you, right there. And I'm like, okay, now I have to ask the question. So I get up and uh, I say, uh, Madam First Lady, this has been an awesome experience. Uh, but at the same time, um, many of us are just privileged to be here, but we know friends or colleagues that could have been here, could have been here with us, but couldn't afford to be here because we're not paid in these roles. Is there something that the administration could do to address that problem? And she gave so you asked her for money? Basically. <laughs> right? That's legendary. That's right. Uh, and she gave this great answer about, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, priorities and limited amount of money, and we have to, you know, prioritize where our money goes. Uh, but I agree with you, Andy, you know, you guys should be paid. Here are some things that you can do. You can go out and fundraise and do these other things. And then at the end, when we went down to take a picture with her, she shook my hand and she said, you know, based off of your question, I know you're going to do amazing things. And I haven't washed this hand since. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. So when, when I think about the best folks I've met along this journey, aside from Rubman Akuchi again, uh, Michelle Obama uh, certainly was one of them. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. So we looked at the bill, we read the bill, and we've yep. been researching the bill, and yep. uh, I just want to just read a, just want a little, little disclaimer here. Representative Vargas is not going to be upset, he's not going to be mad, no. he's not going to start throwing stuff if you disagree with his bill. Yep. This is civics. Yep. Civic discourse. You remember Representative Kelkors, Representative Minacucci, Republican, Democrat, World War III did not break out in this class. We had a nice conversation, and we, we were able to respectfully disagree. So M Representative Vargas, when we testify, is, is perfectly comfortable with you. And a lot of kids have expressed cons, and it's been great. So Representative Vargas, the bill is behind you. Um, and uh, before we get to that, uh, and, and Representative Minaguchi actually helped with this earlier. So yep. this is the bill, yep. uh, number 720, filed it a year ago. Correct. And um, you co-wrote the bill with Dylan Fernandez, is that correct? That's correct. Tell us a little bit about Dylan, because so, he obviously can't be here. Yeah, so Dylan Fernandez is a state representative from Cape Cod, sort of Martha's Vineyard area. Uh, he's 28 years old, I'm 26. We work on issues relative to youth leadership and civic engagement, and so he was a good match for us to file this bill together. And could you tell the class just a little bit about all these people, including Representative Minacucci, who's on there? Yep. Who are all these people, and you know, what's this all about with this list? So all these names that you see here are either state representatives or state senators. And the column on the right is the district that they represent. Mm -hmm. And essentially their names are there because they have co-sponsored the bill, which means that they're willing to say, I support this bill before it even comes to the floor. And so now if the bill comes to the floor, they get to say that they were one of the original co-sponsors of the bill. And so the more co-sponsors that you have on a piece of legislation, the stronger it looks, particularly if you have bipartisan uh, co-sponsorship. And on this bill, we do have a uh, Republican that did co-sponsor as well. Thank you. All right, so my students looked at this bill, yep. and it's very short, thankfully, uh, for us in terms of our analysis. So a couple things that, that the students pointed out first thing they pointed out was the whole concept of city town and 16 or 17. Now, obviously, I misinterpreted the bill, and I think a lot of students did too. So having the author of the bill is great. And if you are against the bill, please listen to the clarification, because I don't know if it may impact, but it definitely puts a different spin on the bill. So Representative Vargas, can you tell us the real meaning of the bill? I know it's very vague, but Give us the specifics, yeah. which could clarify. So, something. how many of you guys think this bill lowers the voting age for federal elections? Right? President. President. No. Okay. How many of you think it lowers the voting age for state elections? Raise your hand. Couple, maybe. How many of you think it lowers? It automatically lowers the voting age for local elections. Right? City or town. Actually, it does none of those things. What this bill does is says each city and town has the authority to make the decision for who votes in their local elections, right? I'll repeat that again. Right now in Massachusetts, if North Andover as a town voted today that they wanted to lower the voting age to 16 or 17, they would have to send that to the state legislature in what's called a home rule petition. And the legislature would have to say, yes, you can do that North Andover, or no, you can't. And what has happened so far is that nine municipalities in Massachusetts, nine cities and towns, have asked the state for the authority to lower the voting age, but the state has essentially ignored it and has not passed it. 
And so all we're doing with this bill is not, not immediately lowering voting age, but we're saying the question as to who votes in local elections, city council or town, uh, town hall, um, uh, school committee, mayor, is a local question. It's not a state question. Those are local elections. And so we should respect local control. So that's what this bill does. It doesn't automatically lower the voting age. If Andover went ahead and lowered their voting age for their local elections, it wouldn't automatically lower the voting age in North Andover. Each city and town can make that decision for themselves under this bill. Yeah, so just a point of clarification, I think everybody got that. I think it was articulated very well. Bill passes hypothetically January 2021. Each community can make that decision. So maybe our friend, Mr. DeSalvo, the moderator of town meeting with his gavel would moderate a meeting where North Andover decides whether or not 16 or 17 year olds giving more options can do this. Did anyone in their research uh, find a city or town in Massachusetts that has already said we're gonna do this? Did anyone find any cities or towns in this class? Um, I think it was Somerville. Somerville, Brookline. Did anyone find a state that's all into this that already is doing it? So I think Maryland was a state. Uh, did anyone find a country that is already doing this? Brazil. Brazil. And did you find one again or no? Uh, sort, of. sort of. Remember we had like to talk about the whole UN thing? Oh yeah, yeah, the UN thing as well. Okay, great. Excellent. So Representative New Vargas, thank you so much for clarifying the language of the bill. Yep. And uh, obviously, it, you know, I think that the average person you know, would probably make the, the possibly the same error that, um, that that this class made, including yours truly. Uh, okay, so how a bill becomes a law, uh, I have kind of like a board game, Candyland, Monopoly thing. So before we get to that, how a bill becomes a law has been very relevant to this class, Representative Vargas and Representative uh, Minicucci. Uh, we talked in civics, we're doing something called a DBQ, which is a document-based question. I remember those. Well, so, right, so you remember those probably from AP, right? Yep. AP history. Yep. So eighth graders are doing this, and they're doing it beautifully. And what a DBQ is, is we give them a controversial debate, and then they use the Constitution to look up pros and cons. So the topic was, has the presidency, not President Trump, has the office of the presidency turned into an elected monarchy? Or has it not? Did the Founding Fathers do a good job or a bad job? Yes? So we were looking at how a bill becomes a law. Okay, and uh, I'm leaving out a lot of steps here, but you know, obviously the Senate and the House of Representatives, let's say hypothetically committees, all that other stuff takes place, they take a vote, they, they, they vote, say yeah, we wanna do this. So it passes both houses. Whose desk does it go to in Washington, D.C. once it passes both houses? Yes? President. President. Could someone tell me if the president has a pen and is you know in a good mood and we all live happily ever after in that instance? Um, what can the president do with that pen? He can veto it and not. Oh, he speak. could veto. I didn't even think of that. Okay, veto means reject. Or what could he also do? He could sign it. And it becomes a law. So when the president vetoes something, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is the bill like permanently dead or can it come back to life? Lots of people from this. Owen, what do you think? I could come back if um, there's a two-thirds majority vote again. So two-thirds majority in both houses, correct? Yes. Thank you so much. So one statistic uh, that I never knew, and I learned it last week, and uh, actually Representative Vargas learned it for the first time uh, today. From, from President Washington all the way down to President Trump, um, what percentage of the time have the legislative branch been successful in overriding a veto, Rihanna? Four percent. Four percent. So the president has won 96% of the time, yes? Um, did that make some of you think that uh, we are living in an uh, elected monarchy, or does that make us not look like a king? What were some of the opinions that some of us developed? In that small example, yes? I thought uh, you kind of made us look more like a monarchy, but at the same time less, because the president can't do something like completely outrageous because it would just get probably repelled okay. or rejected. Yep. But uh, he can also most things that aren't like uh, unanimous. He can just reject. Thank you. Thank you. So, so here's what we're going to talk about now. I would like you to take us through the step of a successful bill becoming a law, yep. the Civic Action Bill, which Governor Baker signed last spring. 
this is this is a very cool story. It, it, you know, and I know some of you, you know, like stories. This is a cool story of the journey that it's taken, like a decade journey. And uh, Representative uh, Vargas is going to share with you that journey. Um, and I think it's a cool story. I did not know this story. There's kind of some humor to it as well. Uh, I think it would make a really cool movie, actually, in my in my opinion. I think it would be cool. <laughs> He's really setting the expectations. <laughs> no, I. Okay. Oh, I like rap music, and when you played the rap music, like that would be my favorite scene. But I'm telling the story for you. I'm gonna shut up. You go. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we're gonna take you through this entire process in an abbreviated way. It's a little bit more complicated than what you see here. But I'll start from when I was 16 years old in high school. When I was at Hebrew High, I was a part of a statewide coalition called Teens Leading the Way. And Teens Leading the Way brings teenagers together from across Massachusetts and asks them what kind of legislation they want to see at Beacon Hill. Whether it's police community relations, climate change, gun violence, these were all issues that we talked about when I was going through the program. And we debated those issues in order to try to come up with a legislative agenda or a bill that we wanted to push that session. And while we debated all those issues, we said, you know what, the bottom line is we can be as passionate as we want about all these issues, about climate change, about gun violence, but if we don't know how to go about effect, uh, implementing change and if we don't have to have an informed and engaged public, that knows how to be an active and responsible citizen in our democracy, then it doesn't matter because we're just yelling into the wind on these issues as opposed to being strategic and having an electorate that actually can vote and reflect the best interests of the entire Commonwealth. So with that, we said, let's, let's file a bill that is a, a major investment in democracy in Massachusetts because if we invest in democracy in Massachusetts, then we can start making all those other things right. So we filed the bill, S00183. Um, it was a bill to mandate civics education in Massachusetts, that every single student had to take civics before they graduated from high school. Uh, we went to the State House, looked for what is in this first step, a member of the House or the Senate that would be our primary sponsor. We found them. And then we went around the building and we looked for co-sponsors. As you saw earlier, you saw all those co-sponsors that were on there. And so we, we ended up finding 48 co-sponsors for our civics education bill. Bipartisan co-sponsors, Democrats and Republicans, that both said this is important. After that, we moved the bill through this process. It made its way to committee. And this is in 2010, remember, I was in high school at the time. The bill gets to committee, and what happens there is that there is a public hearing for every single bill. And so the bill... Uh, came before a committee and people come in and testify and say why they are for or against the bill. We as teenagers decided to submit our testimony both orally uh, saying why we were in favor or against but we also had a hip-hop video that we showed and as far as we know it's the first rap video that has been submitted into official testimony for our bill and the hook was really really corny. Um, how many of you guys know what a Honda Civic is? Raise your hand if you know what a Honda Civic is. Alright, so the hook was on the grind, got to do this, not talking a car, but civics is the movement. It was horrible. Super cheesy, super crazy. So can we just stop for a second? Can we, can we just stop for a second? He's not, can you imagine a bunch of 16 year old kids testifying in front of politicians by showing a rap video? I mean, can you, I, I, that would be so cool to see what their faces were like. Like, were they raising their hands in the air like that? They were. Yeah, oh, a lot of people. A little bit of this. Right, I'm gonna let you continue. I think that would be a cool scene for a movie, but what do I know? So right. we had we had a great public hearing. The response from the legislators was great, but then after a public hearing, the committee has to deliberate on what they want to do. And deliberate meaning they have to decide: do they want to move the bill forward? A. Do they want to change the bill before they move it forward? Make some uh, uh, changes, redraft the bill. Or do they want to kill the bill by essentially saying we need to study this more? Those are the three options that a committee can take. And unfortunately, in 2010, when I was involved, uh, there were several stakeholders that just couldn't come to an agreement. There were certainly teachers that wanted this bill to go through, students that wanted this bill to go through, but there were also some teachers and some individuals that thought that this was another unfunded mandate. Reasonably so, thinking that the state was telling schools, hey, you have to teach this, you have to do this, but not providing more money to actually achieve that. And so the bill failed in 2010, and it died that session. 
However, I stayed involved kind of on the perimeter of Teens Leading the Way. After I went to college, I was advising the group while I was at Boston University. Did a whole bunch of internships, including at the State House when I was at BU. Uh, did an internship in Madrid, Spain, in the US Embassy over there because I studied abroad. When you guys go to college, I hope you study abroad. Did the internship at the White House, then ultimately came back home and ran for city council in Haverhill. I served on the city council in Haverhill for two years, and then this seat opened up in 2017, the seat of state representative. I ran for state representative, won, and joined the Massachusetts legislature as a member of the House. The first thing I did when I got there, though, was find the people who I had met with in 2010 when I was a teenager who were still there as representatives and senators and said, hey, remember me? We were working on civics eight years ago, and now I'm here as a legislator. I'm hoping we can work together to actually move this bill through and get it done this Stop week. for a moment. So at 16, him and his friends roll in, they do the rap video, get some criticism from some of these politicians. 10 years later, they're still there. And he goes, hey, remember me? We're colleagues now. Let's pick up that bill. I mean, you don't think that's legendary? I think that's amazing. Or I'm sorry. I, I think I should be your press manager. I yeah, think I no, can put we'll, spins we'll, on all of this. I'll fight you right for that now. position. <laughs> right, well, go ahead. I'll, 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 I'm sorry. I just think this is cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, we get in there and, and we make the case. And we say, look, we're in a time in American democracy right now where it's never been more important for everyone to understand how fragile our democracy is, number one, but also, number two, what their rights and responsibilities are in our democracy. And so we made the case again, worked with my colleagues to move the bill through this process again, and the bill became a law. And we passed it in the House, we passed it in the Senate, and we sent it to the governor. Now, one thing that's not reflected on here is that if the House and Senate pass uh, civics education bills, let's say, but they're a little bit different, right? Let's say the House says that it has to be implemented by 2021, but the Senate passes a civics bill saying, well, it has to be implemented by 2022. If that's the case, then we have to appoint what's called a conference committee, where the House will send three members and the Senate will send three members to me to talk about the two different civics bill to try, bills to try to make one civic bill. And after that comes out, then it gets sent back out, we vote on it again, and then we send it to the governor. Luckily, in this case, we didn't need a conference committee because both the House and the Senate passed the same exact versions of the bill. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the process that we went through in the civics bill, but it just goes to show how long sometimes it takes to actually get something done. Uh, but if you stick to it, if you have a strong narrative, if you tell your stories, things can get done. So just to clarify, passes both houses, goes to the governors, the chief executive, they'll sign it into law or they will uh, veto it. So uh, we, you all made a really cool assumption in the last lesson where you, we all made the assumption that there's more, that it's much more likely to have an override in Massachusetts than in Washington, D.C. And both Representative Minacucci and Representative Vargas uh, when was the last time you both were successful in overriding the governor? Yeah, just last year. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so it happens a lot more with more frequency here. Yeah. All right. So, here's where we came. Now, and then th this is the gr this is the you know not that everything hasn't been great, but I think this is going to be really cool. Representative Vargas, could yeah. you please just briefly set the rules for this? Is a committee. Yeah. Representative Vargas is taking notes. Um, let's talk a little bit about the forum. Yep. So when, when the bill gets to this process and it gets before a committee, every single bill has to have what's called a public hearing. So what we're going to engage in now is a public hearing. At that public hearing for this bill, uh, you'll have members of both the House and the Senate who are members of that committee sitting behind uh, a dais and they will be able to ask folks questions but also, most importantly, hear from the public as to what side they stand on for any particular piece of legislation that is on the docket for that day. Um, so usually during the public hearing, you have three minutes to testify, you state your name for the record, and it formally goes into the record in, in Massachusetts uh, for, for that uh, particular committee. For this bill, this bill is before the Joint Committee on Election Laws. Does anybody know why it's called the Joint Committee on Election Laws? Joint. Why joint? Go ahead. It's both the House and Senate. There you go. The joint. It's not just a committee of just House members or just Senate members. It's a joint committee with both. So there's a House chair of the committee and a Senate chair of the committee as well. 
So here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. As I said before, don't worry about going con. Don't worry about yeah. going negative. Just go for it. It's great. Representative Vargas and Representative Minacucci want to hear the opposition. Maybe they can address it in some manner. Uh, Representative Minacucci did bring up something really cool in the last class, and that was talking about amendments and just kind of like adding things to bills, obviously throughout the line, um, which was which was a really cool thing. Uh, something in one of the other classes, we were talking about amending this bill. Representative Vargas, I don't think you were here for this, but in the last class, uh, a couple of students said uh, an amendment would be a, a civic competency test that kids would have to take uh, that met with opposition and support. So an example of an opposition or uh, something that could be attached. So here's what's going to happen. If you are the kind of person that you know really want to be in the moment and really want to experience this thing and you, you know, have that kind of outgoingness, you're going to go up to the podium, you are going to state your name, you are going to state your position, and you have three minutes to go and you'll speak directly to Representative Vargas. If that's too intimidating for you, just chill, relax at your table, no problems. Just some clarification, this is not a debate. We had a young lady in the first class who will remain nameless. She was all in for the bill. And when someone came up and spoke against the bill, I could see her get animated. And I was like, easy tiger, easy tiger, relax. And she really wanted a debate. Now, will we have a debate someday in this class? Yes, we will, just not now. Now, we can applaud for each other, which is morally supportive. Representative Minacucci did bring up the reality that applause is not allowed, and gavel would come across, and uh, would not be able to do that. And before you testify, if you're intimidated, uh, Representative Vargas, you said there has been one hearing so far. Yep. You would count this as a second, right? That's right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, enlighten the kids to, now this was in Boston at Beacon Hill, enlighten the kids to how many kids between the ages of 13 and 16 showed up. I, this was yeah. cool. So there were 55 or so panels of people that testified during that hearing day, and about half of those panels were young people that were testifying. People between the ages of you know, 12 to 18 came down to Boston, sat in front of legislators and said, hey, this is why we believe in this bill, and this is why we hope you'll support it. And so a lot of these kids like couldn't even drive, so they had to get their parents to get them there. Um, you know, when, I, I mean, I had my dad drive me to the mall. I can't imagine, like, yeah, Dad, could you bring me to a congressional hearing, okay? I would never think that as an eighth grader, ever. I'd be like, Dad, take me to the Motley Crue concert, all right? That's what I'd want, all right? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. First one is always the toughest. Who's the brave soul that's going to go? Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> nice. So you're going to chill there or go to get the whole experience? Oh, right. I'll go up. Go to the podium, yeah. I'm moving this back yeah right there and then you're going to state your first and last name whether you're for or against and please feel free to bring up your work uh, or you can just speak off the cuff you are first hey my name is Rihanna Lumbo and I am for this film and I think first we need to start encouraging effective civic learning in younger people they need to be heard in like the matters that affect them and they need to make voting a habit because the USA voting turnouts are like going down every year and if we start at a younger age more people are going to want to start voting and it'll become like a larger habit for people to vote. And then young people are also, they have adult responsibilities, but are denied the same rights that adults are like given. Like they're expected to follow the law, but they're expected that it doesn't matter, they, don't, they shouldn't have any say in it. And then, so like they can vote, they have, or not they can't vote, they should be able to vote and they have to pay their taxes, they can work, they're able to like take a test to see if they can drive but they're not able to vote, so they just have to kind of live in an area and they have to follow the law and do what it says, but not be able to say anything about it or do anything for it. Thank you. Great. Great. You can applaud. Yeah. <laughs> Rihanna, can I just embarrass you for a second? I just want to, uh, so when Rihanna was doing research yeah. and looking at kids' supporters, she actually had kind of a personal connection uh, so I, I don't know if you're familiar with the person that she's going to, could you just, you're, what's your connection? Samantha Beckins. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like for it and she is like really for this and is trying to get her school and all her friends and stuff and teachers to like be for the bill. And how do you know her? 
Uh, I have a friend that lives in like Milton, gotcha. and it's just like through him. Yeah, I thought that was kind of cool that they, you know, she made that connection. That's awesome. Man. That's and the most powerful issues are are advanced in the legislature when they have a, a movement that is statewide, right? And so the fact that it's not just concentrated in certain parts of Massachusetts, and we have people and leaders all across, that's how you actually move the agenda forward. So it's encouraging to hear that. Thank you. Who else is coming? Come on, come on down, sir. State your name, your position, and then uh, Representative Vargas is gonna listen. Uh, and I'm Representative Kuchi. I'm Tom. Last name also, I know uh, it, but could you say it? I'm Tom Sistek. I am for the bill, but with an amendment. Um, I think that uh, there should be a quiz or a test to see if you're politically competent, because a lot of kids do just agree with their parents blindly and don't really think for themselves. But I do think there are a, even a majority of kids who could, if they proved themselves, like vote competently and like not just t like a guy because he's right, you, you could speak to you could speak to him. You don't have to look at the camera. Don't worry about like, that. Oh, I think that guy's cool. I'm gonna vote for him. Yeah. But not actually look at, like what they support or anything. Great. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. All right. Who else would like to testify? Come on. Don't be shy. Period 86. Come on. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is good. By the way, when someone gets into the podium, you do not say, oh, God. <laughs> um, so my name is John McDevitt, and I'm for the bill. Um, and a lot of the stuff Rihanna pointed out, I agree 100% with, and how uh, teens and like 18-year-olds uh, and them, uh, they're forced to follow the laws, but they have no say in what they are or what rules regulate them. and they're. They're allowed to work full-time jobs, they can pay taxes, they can get married with parental consent, drop out of school, donate blood, again, with parental consent, uh, obtain a passport, and um, but they can't check a box and make a decision on who like makes the rules and who like, regulates their town or city. Thank you very much, Sean. All right, anyone else want to? Thank you very much, Lieutenant. I really appreciate this. All right, everyone's doing a great job. You guys are very comfortable up there. I'm loving it. McKenna, introduce yourself. To <laughs> My name is McKenna Doobie, and I'm against the bill. Great. I would say that as much as I would love the right to vote like, at a younger age, I don't think that I would be able to vote without feeling like I have to do this, feeling pressured into it because of peer pressure, which is definitely a great issue. That like. No one really assesses when they think about, oh, let's make the voting age younger. And there's also the fact that like our brains, especially our prefrontal lobe, which helps us make decisions, are not fully developed even at the age of 18. So why lower the age to even lower states? Thank you. Thank you, McKenna. Thank you for stating the opposition after following four pro people. Uh, that takes a lot of guts, and I really, really appreciate it. And it's made the, made the class better. Uh, so thank you. Who else would like to speak? Would anyone else? Thank you so much. I knew 86 would not disappoint. I knew it. I just didn't want to brag too much, but I knew they would be disappointed. Um, I'm Grace Barros, and I'm for the bill. Um, I feel like after, uh, especially our grade, well, our team taking a civics class, I feel like we're all more civically um, act active and we all are very interested in the way the government works works and stuff. And I feel like that if we had a chance to vote, I feel like we would really like be re uh, into it, I guess. Yeah. And because we all love the civic program that we're doing currently. And I feel like if we were actually involved in the civics outside of school, then it would really help us so we could be prepared if we're having future careers with civics in it. And I feel like ever since I got into civics, uh, this class, I've been wanting to be more in a, a career with civically wise. And I feel like we can ch we can vote for something that will impact us more, more mostly. So. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very well said. Very, very well said. Giving a shout out to the program too. I did not pay her. I did not pay her, by the way. Uh, all right. Who else would like to speak? 
Thank you so much. This is great. We might uh, have the highest percentage. All right, let's listen, please. Uh, I'm Yasmin Mashkor, and I'm for the bill. I believe that in the time of like today, with social media, and I feel that nowadays people are more confident in their opinion, are, and they're not really afraid, and they just people are a lot more outspoken. And I believe that younger people should have the right to decide what goes on like, around them, like. And in addition, um, with all like all these controversial controversial topics such as like abortion, gun laws, and above, if we make the start to be able to vote just in local areas, I think that in the future we can um, lower the voting age for other topics like for president, like for presidents and stuff. And I think that we should have the right to. Side on things. We never really know when the world is going to end, which sounds kind of <laughs> dramatic, but I think that we should have a right for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well said. Yes, please, come on up. and I would not like to state my side. So, first thing about this new bill is that I feel like it would increase the diversity of all of the voting. It would make it so that there are different viewpoints voting and it's affecting especially our future, which is why they, we would, um, should be able to vote. But, as McKenna has said, the brain does not develop till age 25, um, fully develop until age 25, especially the prefrontal lobe, which um, could lead to reckless or rash behavior, and you never want that, especially in politics. <laughs> and <Don't worry. laughs> uh, Also, uh, one argument that I've heard a lot is that people our age would not care at all for this to vote and that would skew it just so they, they would see like a cooler candidate but um, one of the things I found in my research was that Scotland has actually lowered their age in 2014 to 16 their voting age is 16. They lowered it in 2014. And that is all I have to say. Thank, Thank you very much for coming up here. That was cool. That was cool uh, and kind of sharing with the information you got. Yeah. Hold, hold, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> so, is anyone that has not gone up? Yes, please. Thank you. More, another person to join the party. So my name is Maddie Kennedy and Great. I am for the bill because as they said like teens are held for responsible for like a lot of the same things that adults are and also I have a fact that in 2016 in California alone over 200,000 teenagers pre-registered to vote before their 18th birthday so that shows that they do really care and also I feel like um, even if they, like people might say they make like rash decisions, but if they're gonna take the time to go and like register to vote and take time out of their day to go and vote, I'm pretty sure that most teenagers would like take the time to consider who they're voting for and like the different sides. And also for things like school committee, that directly affects us. So if we had a say in that, there would be a lot better like, I don't know, just management of issues that affect you. Well said, well said, thank you so much. So, who has not spoken that would like to speak? Last call, going once, twice, three times. So, so here's the deal, who has not spoken? Just raise your hand if you've not spoken. I'm not making you speak. Would you yield your three minutes and just give it to someone else? 
Yeah. Okay. Would you yield your three minutes and give it to someone else? Are you comfortable with that? Uh, yeah. Okay. So the two of you want to speak? So we've had two wonderful people at the committee that want to yield. Is this something allowed or am I breaking a rule? Uh, usually it's not allowed during a committee, right. but um, it, we can talk we after could. just like this. All right. Yeah. All right. So how about not officially, but speaking yeah. from your seats, notes still being taken. Is that a good compromise? Yeah. Um, so one thing that um, when we both were doing our research, we landed on like similar sites. And so uh, um, one like interesting fact we found was that um, in uh, 2013, uh, Maryland lowered the voting age to 16. And the turnout rate was four times the voters over uh, 18. So like more people who were under 18 showed up. So there were four times the people under who were over. So we think that um, if the voting age is lower here, then more people like will show up. And since we're gonna like be here, these issues that we're voting on now will still impact our futures. And so uh, we think that's important that we should be we also find that uh, Scotland lowered their age to 16 and they had similar results and their voting like went up. And then um, young people's voices are like also constantly ignored and then when they try and do things like peacefully protest about things and do walkouts or something, they'll end up just getting in trouble. So there's no point in really trying anymore. So if we're allowed to vote young, it'll allow us to make our up our minds. And Not as much risk. Without like as much risk knowing we're going to get in trouble and knowing that we can do it freely and we're allowed to do it and there's really if you think about it not a wrong vote you can't really vote wrong if it's your opinion no one can say your opinion is wrong it's what you want it's what you like it's what you think is going to be the best that's right yeah. great job guys. anybody come across uh, in your research this thing called hot cognition and cold cognition did anybody come across that in your research i got a little Maybe. A little bit? Yeah. And just so you know, we to get to awards, maybe about a minute. And yeah, I'd love so just to talk real quick, about maybe as you as you further study this issue, look into hot cognition and cold cognition. Hot cognition is the, the cognition that you use in your brain when you're under stress, when you're under a lot of uh, pressure and you're forced to kind of do something under pressure, whereas cold cognition is what you use when you're in a calm environment, when maybe you're taking a, uh, a, a test or going into a voting booth, right? That's the, the cognition that we use when we're voting, and what psychologists have found is that by 16, cold cognition is fully formed. It's hot cognition that isn't fully formed until you're 25. Um, so I think that's something for you guys to just do some more research on later on as you write your editorials. So, Representative Vargas, I have not had the opportunity to pose this question to you, and I really want to do it because this is the fifth. You've been to four classes today, so I think you've seen at least 100 kids. So for you, as the person who went on a 10-year journey to write the civics bill and to come here today to see this group of kids who are piloting, who did not sign up for this, by the way, and really didn't have a choice. <laughs> so so what are you feeling? Like, how does it make you feel? Like, what are you experiencing yeah. for it? Yeah. Because no, this is like your, this is your baby, I mean, like in terms yeah. of the bill. Yeah. No, thank you. I think, you know, it, um, a lot of times in politics and public service, it's tough to see the actual outcomes of the work that we do. I mean, we work day in and day out trying to both uh, address constituent issues, people who call us looking for you know, health care, jobs, you know, potholes, whatever, while we also fight to move our legislation forward and pass laws that hopefully make life better in the Commonwealth and Massachusetts. And so to be here at the end of a you know, journey that started when I was in 2010, to see this play out and manifest itself in front of me and to see how animated you all are and how energized you all are and how passionate you are just is, it feeds my soul, but more than anything gives me hope that we're gonna be all right in this country because we have all of you guys and that the generations that are coming up uh, behind us and understand that we're all in this together. We gotta figure out how to how to lead a, a more civil and a more democratic society where everybody can, can have a safe uh, place. So good place to end. Uh, could, could you please give our guests a warm welcome? I'm welcome, goodbye. Long day, long day. So here's the deal, I'm gonna send you a related art, but uh, I have let Representative Vargas know, and Representative Minakushi already knows this. Uh, every month, this is our seventh uh, civics in action uh, awards uh, speaker series. 
we give an award to a civic agent of the month, and I'm going to embarrass you for the many times for it. All civic agents of the month from September through December, please stand so Mr. Vargas can see you. These are all of our winners. All right. All right, two more. These are the first two of 2020. Uh, so the first first person that I'd like to uh, oh, recognize. Someone who's not super outgoing all the time, but it, the quality of his, sometimes when, you know, when kids answer, they don't say a lot, but the quality of what they say at that one moment in time is pretty awesome. Also, work that I get back from this person really impresses me, and clearly, uh, you know, this person understands civics very well. So for his consistent civic engagement and contributions to my class, whether loud or quiet, uh, Owen, I'd like to recognize you, sir. Yes, please. Thank you very much, my friend. So when I pick these, when I pick these awards, it's always such a struggle for me. Uh, I was telling Representative uh, Vargas that uh, you know we're going to probably be able to recognize 100, 110 um, kids out of 120, um, and so. The next person I want to recognize, I know I struggled because there were a lot of people in the running for this one this month, and um, when she spoke multiple times, I was like, you did the right thing, Pat. You knew what you were doing last night at 11.45. All right, so with that, uh, Rihanna L., I'd like you to come on down. Congratulations. Very, very nice talk. If you could compose with our two reps, that would be great. I'll take a nice picture of everybody. All right. All right thank you. Beautiful. All right. All right. Show your awards. Ready? One, two, three. Beautiful. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your leave your leave your black books, push in your chairs. Feel free to introduce yourself or say hello to Representative Vargas or Representative Minucci. Thank you for a great week. You guys were awesome. Thank you so much. Leave it. I'll take care of everything.